My name is Bronwyn Healy and this is my story. The first time I ever told this story publicly, I was 30 years old and I was speaking at an elite fancy boys school here in Australia and I got up and I was nervous as like my knees were shaking and I knew my story and I got up in front of this group of fancy private school boys and I was like, hi, I'm Bronwyn Healy, I'm 30 years old and I giggled because I was nervous and I was like, I know I look way younger than that. And this sweet young man in the back row put his hand up and he was like, excuse me, miss, you look 21. And I was like, thank you, that's kind. And most women would take that as a compliment. <laughs> However, when I was 21, I was actually a messed up drug addicted prostitute and I weighed 45 kilos, nearly 90 pounds. And I looked and I felt and I smelt like death warmed up. This young man turned pale, thought he was going to pass out from embarrassment. And I looked at him right in the back row and what came out of my mouth next not only changed his countenance, thankfully, but it changed my life because it confirmed in my heart this process of what I'd been doing. And I was literally like, but my past is not my future. And what I've done is not who I am. Who I am is loved and who I am is valued. My voice matters, my story matters. And the whole room went silent and my heart was just still and my knees stopped shaking. And I thought to myself, that's it. That's the story I wanna tell for the rest of my days. And so I then went on to tell my story. I was born to an alcoholic dad. When I was three, he got sober. Uh, through a self-help program, he says to his own confession all of these 42 years later, he got sober but he never really got free and there's a big difference between being clean and sober and being free. We lived in this space where they tried to do better as parents. They loved me the best way they knew how. When I was 13 years old, we moved from one state of Australia to another and I thought I was moving to the promised land. Like there was theme parks and there was a beach an hour away and it was, I thought, heaven on earth. And I went to this fancy private girls school and there were lots of mean girls. I didn't fit in, I didn't belong, I didn't know who I was. And so I struggled and I tried to fit in and I tried to fit in here and I tried to fit in there. And I remember sitting in the guidance counselor's office and I was literally just like, these girls are mean. And she was just like, you need to try, like find a group at lunchtime, find a small group, try and find a way to fit in. And so I tried a bunch of different groups and then I felt like a failure. And every time I couldn't do something, I didn't just think I failed at that thing. I put a label on myself that said failure. At the age of 15 over here in Australia, they start to say to you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because you need to make subject choices based on what you want to do at university. And so I decided I was going to make movies and go to Hollywood. And so the school I went to didn't offer film and TV. So I found a school that did. And I told my mum and dad about it. And I still remember their faces so clearly. They were just like, there's gangs at that school. We've read about it in the newspaper and there's drugs. And my, my heart response, and now I'm a mum of three incredible young women aged 15, 17, 19. And we have not this conversation, but similar conversations where they think they know best and I really know best. I did know how to say yes. And I did know how to say no. And I got all the way to two weeks out from the end of my final year at school and I had the grades to get to university. Someone offered me to smoke pot and I said yes. And that began a downward spiral that I had no idea was going to take me literally into the pits of hell. It, I thought it's just a bit of pot. It's just, it's me. It's my choice. That kind of freedom is a counterfeit freedom. And so by the end of grade 12, I was smoking pot every day and then started to try other drugs because I had all this time off between then and university. So I tried speed and ecstasy and cocaine and I started to party. By the time I got to my second year at university, I'd fallen in and out of relationships, sex, drugs, rock and roll, literally, and ended up in a relationship with a guy who was known to be a heroin addict. And I ended up falling pregnant and I made a decision that, again, I'd didn't have any training in knowing any better. And I made a decision to have a termination. And I had no one tell me you could end up feeling really guilty and really ashamed. And if you do, you're gonna to wanna to get numb and you're gonna to wanna to feel void. And so I had the termination and I got guilty and I felt ashamed. 
and I wanted to be numb. And so I asked this boyfriend for heroin and eventually he gave me some and I was 18 years old and I ended up using heroin every day between the ages of 18 and 24. I went from using $20 worth a day to up to $1,000 worth a day, having to do whatever it took to get the money to get the drugs. That meant stealing from my job at a cinema, um, getting fired from that job. I'd sold all my possessions. I'd stolen from family and friends. When I got fired from my job, I remember thinking the only thing I have left is my body. I remember making a phone call to an escort agency and the lady literally saying to me, how old are you? 20. Are you pretty? My mum thinks I am. Although by that stage, my mum didn't really think I was because I looked like death. So I had an interview with that lady and she literally said to me, can you start tonight? Now, there's no training ground for going to work as a prostitute in the sex industry. And all she literally said to me was, there's just no kissing, this is not intimacy, this is sex. And that was it. That was my training. I did that work for nearly 12 months. I speak in a lot of different places now and a lot of young women say to me, 12 months isn't really very long. I mean, it's just sex with strangers, right? My thankful God-given response is 12 seconds is too long. When I eventually ran away from the sex industry, I tried in my own strength to get off drugs. Um, I eventually ended up at the age of 24 years later in a doctor's surgery and he was known to help people that had addictions and I thought well if I've been using heroin for six years I guess that's a bit of a problem. But the fact that I was still alive was literally a miracle. He looks at me and he says I don't think drugs are your problem. I was like yeah no they are. I don't know if you've been listening well rude. He said your problem is you have a hole in your soul only Jesus can fill. And I very colourfully told him what I thought he could do with what he thought Jesus could do for me. Every second word was a swear word in, out of my mouth in those days. And I was angry. I was so angry. I was angry at me, at the world. If I'd have believed in a God, I would have been angry at him. And he told me that I needed to go to rehab if he was going to help me. And he didn't tell me that that rehab was run by Christians. And I went to this place and I felt like I was in the twilight zone. And what I realize now, 21 long years later, is that it was a conspiracy from heaven. <laughs> they made me go to church and I would stand outside the doors and blow my cigarette smoke in their building just to annoy the crap out of them. And they would say, we see you, come in, eat cookies. And they were trying to woo me into the kingdom, basically with their sweetie goods. And one Sunday it was pouring rain and I didn't have a choice but to go inside the building. And it was the 15th of August, 1999. And I went inside that building and it was a date with destiny that I didn't know was happening. I was given a brand new life and hope for my future and not just hope for my future, hope for the future of any person whose path I would ever cross because I very quickly became a voice and a mouthpiece. I didn't even realize I was doing it. I was simply telling my story. A story that says, I once was lost and now I'm found. A story that says, I was blind, but now I see. A story that says, I now know what true freedom is. And it's freedom in him. And it's freedom to be me. And it's freedom that then for the last 21 years, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, hasn't been an easy pathway. But not one day of those 21 days have I ever walked alone nor will I ever. I parent, solo parent, those three phenomenal daughters. I have been married twice and divorced twice in my young lifetime. And divorce sucks and it's painful and people get hurt. And it's become a part of my story. It's become a part of the mosaic that makes up my heart. And when I surrender the mosaic pieces of my heart, light comes through. And I hope that in the hearing of this story, Hope has been whispered to you. You see joy. You see joy on my face despite my circumstances. Because that, that's my story. Mm -hmm.